But you have to wonder if they're going to rotate him, if they're going to rotate Epps, if they're going to rotate Anthony Harris. Is it going to be a three-man rotation there? Is John Pagan going to mix and match stuff? But I was a little concerned about the depth of the safety position. I'm not concerned about that anymore now that Chukwiski tarts there. I, I, I like the signing. I like that he can provide some competition for both Epps and Harris. Probably more Epps than Harris at this point, but I I hope on come week one it's Chukwiski tart and Marcus Epps. Uh, no disrespect to Anthony Harris, but I kind of want to see what those two can do on the field again. Mac and Mac guys here on Birds 365. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe. We subscribe to bringing in Jeff Carr whenever we get the possibility. Eve of CBSSports.com, who when he was on with us uh, most recently, said, had a Vegas trip coming up. We know what happens in Vegas is supposed to stay in Vegas, but you got to give us a little something, something here. JK, how was your trip to Vegas? Can I tell you guys how I bowled, or do you want to go to the late night stories? Uh, well, I don't know about Jody, but I want the late night stories. I know what you bold. It's a solid 247, I'm going to guess. Yeah, I wish. If I bold a 247, <laughs> I might be quitting birds 365 and trying something else. But <laughs> I, bold, I bold all right for my first time out there. You know, 1480 for nine games isn't bad. It's not great. Now, what's your, your high game? My high game? Jeff? I bold a 300. There we go. That's why I see what, what you know, 247 is not out of the realm. Maybe well, not Nick the there, arrow it, level. It's hard yeah. out there. It's I'm bowling on the pro shot out there. You know, I'm not bowling. What, what is the difference the for us non-bowlers? What is the difference that uh, you, you, you said you bowled on the pro shot? What is the difference? Okay, so if you watch like a PBA tour match, you're always seeing how hard it is for even those guys to get a strike. So there's a lot – how can I put it as easily as I can? There's a lot less leeway. So say you, us three would go bowling at our local bowling alley. Um, right. You can miss your mark by, uh, we measure by boards. There's 30 boards on the lane. You can miss your mark by about eight or nine and get a strike there. You can't miss by one or two or else mm. your 10 is going to be a five. So it, it gets pretty difficult. And that's what happened to me my first day on Wednesday. I missed my Mark by about a board or two, and I'm getting spares I can't make. The, the key out there is getting spares you can make and capitalizing on them, and that's what I was able to do the last day of the tournament. Right. John, did you have any idea that bowling was this complex? No, I didn't. I thought you just, I, threw, it, I thought you just threw it down the lane and tried to get it between yeah. the one and three pin and yeah. take your chance. I'm just, I, I'm just I had proud. no idea. I'm just proud the day that I could have him take the bumpers down. And say, yeah, I can do this. <laughs> All you got to do is stay, uh, I, I'll get you to be a 150 bowler easily, McMullen. I, I'll tell no, you. I'm, 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 actually, I'm actually half decent. I can get to one. I, I haven't bowled in a long time, but I could get to 150. Probably not much higher. But I have good hand-eye coordination. At least I did when I could mm -hmm. see. Uh, you know what? It's a lifetime sport. If you have good hand-eye coordination in your 20s, you still have good hand-eye coordination in your – There you go. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, I bowled when I was a teenager, and it's been a long time since. But uh, I had fun when I did it. Glad to hear you're still having fun. All right, so you went out to Vegas, had some fun, and then came back and found out Jaquiski Tart, signed by the Philadelphia Eagles – it's wait, 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 Jody, before what? we get to... Uh, oh, you uh, want to go to late night? You yeah. think he's going to give us late night details? I, was, I want Spearmint Rhino details, Jeff Kerr. Did, did you make it to... <laughs> well, Spearmint? I'll tell you what. So I was on the strip every day. And we're walking up the stairs at Caesars. And I had to make sure to bust on my one buddy who might be listening right now. I won't give him his name. But we saw um, some... Um, Stuff you normally don't see in the outside world there. And, oh, yeah. And me and my this... buddy saw it. We looked and smiled, and he was looking down, and it wasn't at his phone, and he missed the entire thing. It was right in front of us. And oh, we, we've been busting on about it all week. So, Same all you got to do, you is do when you go to yeah. bed, you got to have the phone ready to take a picture at all yeah. times. You basically have to keep your phone in front of your face because you never know what you're going to see, and you want to snap a picture of if it happens in front of you. Uh, well, exactly. And, you know, that's what we're, you know, we're thinking of ourselves. We're like, oh, he must have been looking at us. No, he didn't have his phone out. So we're like, 
What's he doing? Like, it's yeah. Vegas. I'm like, I told him, you got to be more observant. You got to walk with your head up. Got to be very observant. Just go to the MGM lobby. You'll have fun just walking through. The oh, lobby. yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> I, I was a little intoxicated when I was at the MGM lobby. Okay, uh, there's some, uh, there's some slushies can get to you after a while. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, just let me make one suggestion: don't drink and bowl, okay? If you're gonna, you don't want to combine those two things. You can end up and seriously end up hurting yourself and the possibility of. Hurting oh, I don't drink when I bowl. That that, that was the best part. It's okay. I, I can't do that. I, I know people that are good at doing that. I, I can't do it. I I have to be laser focused at all times. All right, just making sure you're not drinking and bowling. All right, back to Jaquiski Tart. You weren't drinking. It really did happen. The Eagles went out and got themselves a veteran center. Not a Pro Bowl level center, but a starting center uh, for years in San Francisco. The 49ers decided not to re-sign him. We're speculating that the Eagles have gotten him for somewhere near the veteran minimum because where we are on the calendar and the fact that he has a chance to sign with everybody for months now and didn't, uh, and the Eagles got it done over the weekend. What was your first impression when you heard Jaquiski Tart added to the safety room of the Philadelphia Eagles? Well, the first thing I thought was I'd love to see him and Marcus Epps on the field together, which I think now is very possible. But you have to wonder if they're going to rotate him, if they're going to rotate Epps, if they're going to rotate Anthony Harris. Is it going to be a three-man rotation there? Is John Fagan going to mix and match stuff? But I was a little concerned about the depth of the safety position. I'm not concerned about that anymore now that Jaquiski Tart's there. I, I, I like the signing. I like that he can provide some competition for both Epps and Harris, Probably more Epps than Harris at this point, but I I hope on come week one it's Shaquiski Tart and Marcus Epps. Uh, no disrespect to Anthony Harris, but I kind of want to see what those two can do on the field together. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's how I kind of described it, Jeff. I, I'd like the sentiment behind the signing. It's a nice insurance policy. I still think the Eagles would like uh, Marcus Epps to take the baton and start I think they want Kayvon Wall. I think they want the light to go off for Kayvon Wallace. But if it doesn't, uh, in either case, um, you have that insurance policy of, of Jaquaski Tart. Um, and they've done this before with Corey Graham, uh, Andrew Sandejo, Jonathan Cyprian. Last year was Andrew Adams. A lot of times it doesn't work. I was saying September 11th in Detroit. I think there's better, this is how I described it to Jody, and I want to get your thoughts, Jeff, better than a 50% chance right now that Tart's going to be a starter September 11th in Detroit. But I also think there's about a 20% chance he's not even on this team. I think this is going to be that kind of contract. If You know what? If the young guys take off, all right, thanks for the summer. Uh, Chikoski, uh nice knowing you. Jonathan Cyprian out the door. What do you think? I'll tell you what. I agree with that if Kayvon Wallace shows up to play. I think Kayvon right. Wallace is the guy that can go from that fringe roster player to, dare I say, starter? I, I mean, if he can figure it out in year three. And I always thought there were unrealistic expectations for him to begin with as a fourth-round pick. Out of Clemson, you know, Eagles Yeah, well, the Dawkins, the Clemson. assumption – you know, the next guy, next Brian Dawkins is go, oh, he's from Clemson. Yeah, that's that's kind of silly. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it was almost like the time when Macho Harris was drafted in the fifth round and everybody thought, oh, that's a replacement with Brian Dawkins. He, he's going to be great. I'm like, no, Brian Dawkins only comes around probably once every 40 years for a franchise if they're lucky. So, but I mean, I don't think Kevin Wallace has been bad his first two years. I just, he just hasn't done anything to me where I say, okay, like he deserves to start or he deserves a lot of playing time. It, it's it's really awkward with him. He, he's playing like a fourth-round pick, and I know he's very um, social media friendly, which I think is good. I, I don't think he lets a lot of stuff get under his skin. I just think he likes to put his head down and go to work. I hope it turns out well for him because I, I think he's a good guy. I, I want to see him at least contribute to his defense. I mean, he's still got, in my opinion, this year to prove himself. I don't think he's a roster bubble candidate or anything like that, but yeah, everybody says uh, Jaquiski Tart is going to push Marcus Epps for a starting job. I think Kayvon Wallace can push Jaquiski Tart for a job. We'll see how it plays out. Uh, we like to speculate here during the offseason 
on what Jonathan, Jonathan Gannon's defense is going to look like, uh, best case scenario, what would he like to put in place? And a lot of times we default back to, well, but he needs specific type of players. If he can implement the exact system he wants to run, here's what he needs out of his players, which you can say about all 32 teams in the National Football League, and we certainly say it about the Eagles and Gannon in his second year here. What does Tart bring to the table that if he's up to the speed that he has been with the 49ers last several years, John just made a great point, guys who are, seem to be descending very infrequently go the other way and get better. So we don't expect them to get better than what he was in San Francisco. But if he can hold his line, what does he bring to the table in Gannon's defense that will allow Gannon to do more of what he wants to do? I think you're going to get a solid starter that – how can I put this in the best words possible? He will make turnovers thanks to the quarterbacks that are playing. So Darius Slay and James Bradbury, I think – that sets him up. The NFC Championship game, not, notwithstanding, because he did drop the interception that probably would have sent the 49ers to the Super Bowl at that point. But he's a guy that he can create turnovers, and he's going to get his opportunities because of the cornerback situation there and because how deep the Eagles are a cornerback. And let's face it, guys, they need a safety that can make some plays. And I think he can do that for them. But I also think Marcus Epps can do that as well. So it's going to be interesting. I think you're going to get a reliable starter – that can make a play in the box, that can kind of play hero a bit deep in coverage. But I, I just think they need a guy that can help them create some turnovers when the pass rush is on. And because Darius Slay and James Bradbury, you know, they'll, they'll have, they'll have their hands full. So I'm looking at it as. Do we freeze Jeff Kerr? Oh, is Jeff he frozen? Yeah. Jeff's He's a happy frozen. looking Hopefully. dude. Yeah. So I'm sure he was going to say something positive about the Eagles, which we'll always take. We'll try and reestablish with Jeff, Jeff uh, bring him back on as he shares his thoughts with uh, Jaquiski Tart with us. Eagles signing on Friday. Hopefully we do get Jeff back up because there's a couple of uh, national storylines that we want to be able to tap in with him. Jeff returned to us, got unfrozen. Um, got your take on Tart and Eagles defense and the like. JK, I do want to ask you about the Baltimore Ravens and what they're dealing with right now with their quarterback, Lamar Jackson. You've been covering the league for a while. I have John has, I don't remember a situation like this and it's only been applicable with uh, new CBAs and contract changing and money going up for the last, however many years, it's not like we can tie this to a quarterback situation from the seventies or eighties, but at least over the last 20 some odd years, a quarterback whose contract is up, he's already won an MVP the team wants to resign him and knows what the going rate is for a quarterback of his accomplishment and his age. And the player is like shrugging it off that he doesn't have an agent that he says they've had a couple of conversations, but he doesn't seem to be in any rush to get a quarterback done uh, a contract done. It seems like every player in the NFL wants that long-term contract with the guaranteed money up front. Lamar's like, yeah, we'll get to it when we get to it. How weird is the relationship right now between the Ravens and Lamar Jackson? I think it's an awkward situation. I wouldn't go by weird. And I think it's because Lamar is his own agent. And I think he's looking at it as, well, I could get $40 million right now. But if I have come out and have an MVP-type season, I can get $50 million. I can get more than Josh Allen. I can get more than Aaron Rodgers. And I think that's what he's banking on. I think he's banking on himself, giving the most money – he can. And if it's not from the Baltimore Ravens, it's going to be from somebody. And I think that's what he's I think he wants people to bid for him. I, I don't think he necessarily wants to leave Baltimore. I just think he wants people gushing over him. And you know, I, I don't like putting words in Lamar Jackson's mouth because I think he ultimately will resign with the Baltimore Ravens. I think he's a, you know, he's a fantastic quarterback. But I just keep looking at it as – man, this guy really wants to get paid. And I, I don't blame him because I think he knows his shelf life is probably shorter than a Patrick Mahomes, a Josh Allen, and Aaron Rodgers. And get the most money you can and call the day. Yeah, you're probably right. He's betting on himself, essentially. He's coming off his worst season statistically. So if he bounces back and becomes Lamar Jackson again in the MVP level, Lamar Jackson, yeah, then he's going to be in the conversation with, 
the highest ranking quarterbacks perhaps become, you know how this works. It's about timing and circumstance. He becomes the highest paid quarterback in NFL history until it's the next guy's turn. Um, you know, on the other hand, you start thinking to yourself, how much, how much money is enough money? You know, if you get paid 40 million in one year, you should be able to live the rest of your life. So do you want that security? I think that's the debate. And everybody's a little bit different. Kirk Cousins, he bet on himself. He wins year after year after year. Um, other guys want that security, want the long-term uh, contract, all the guaranteed money. But I think you hit the nail on the head. He's betting on himself. And I always respect when a player bets on himself. Um, now I got to talk about another quarterback, Jeff. And that's uh, the quarterback of the Cleveland Browns. Or – one projected quarterback of the Cleveland Browns. We assume at some point Deshaun Watson will be quarterbacking the Cleveland Browns. Will it be in the 2022 season? Because things seem to be coming to a head and there's reports out there that the NFL is looking at a significant suspension, whatever significant means could be 12 games, could be a full season. Where do you think the NFL is going with Deshaun Watson? And do you think the NFLPA reacts? Do you think Deshaun reacts? Do you think they fight a potential significant suspension? I actually think the NFL should take a page out of Major League Baseball's playbook when it comes to this. And when Major League Baseball had the Trevor Bauer situation, they basically told Trevor Bauer, go away. Go away. You're on the commissioner's exempt list, or I, I forgot what – uh, Manfred put him on. It's probably one of the good things Rob Manfred has actually done as a commissioner. Just say, hey, go away. Is that the one? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got one. Yeah, yeah, he's got one. So go away. We'll handle it. And again, it was a story like every week they put him on the commissioner's exempt list and everybody's making a mockery of him. I'm like, well, he's not playing. They're, they're trying to get this thing resolved. And then they ultimately hand it down. I, I forget the actual length of the suspension, but I think it's going to equate to two years. Two years, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I would years. do with Deshaun Watson. I would tell him, hey, you know what? Go away. You're definitely not helping yourself. Uh, your organization ain't helping you. So we're going to take matters in our own hands. And D. Smith, if you want to – in the NFLPA, if you want to play hardball with this, you know what? No, you don't have a choice. Um, this guy is – there's definitely some skeletons in that closet. Um, whether it's you know, you're know, you for or against Deshaun Watson, there's definitely something there. And I, I would just – Say until this situation is resolved, where it's 2023, 2024, you tell this guy to just go away because I don't like the stuff he's saying. I don't like the stuff his organization is saying. Oh, and by the way, now the Haslam's want to build a new stadium on the lake <laughs> in Cleveland, you know, so they're trying to distract from everything else. Uh, by the way, the, the company that has their naming rights also is in some legal issues as well. So it is not a good time to be a Cleveland Browns fan or be a member of that organization. All right, so you were out in Vegas for a couple of days. I need to find out if, A, you ran into any of Deshaun Watson's masseuses. And number two, did you potentially see Baker Mayfield? Because people are now talking about, you know, that's the reason why they haven't traded Baker? Because they could be looking at an entire year of a Deshaun Watson suspension, and they have got a better chance to make the playoffs with Baker Mayfield than they do with Jacoby Brissett. Is Baker actually going to stay in Cleveland, J.K.? I think Carolina gets him. I think they're, they're just waiting for that right opportunity to strike. I just don't think they want to pay him that fifth-year um, rookie salary. I, I, I think they're hoping Cleveland releases him. I don't think that's going to happen. But I think ultimately Carolina's going to say, Sam Darnold sucks. We can't go into the year with him. <laughs> it's, it, Matt Rule's coaching for his job right now. He, you can't tie his NFL future to Sam Darnold. He'll never coach again. So – I, I think they got a trade for Baker Mayfield, and I'd love to see Baker Mayfield against the Cleveland Browns week one of the season because that's who Carolina plays. And I actually think an upset Baker Mayfield, a fired-up Baker Mayfield, may be a good thing for his next team. I don't think he's as bad of quarterback as everybody makes him out to be. I, I don't think he's a top-10, top-15 quarterback by any stretch, but I think he could have a little bit of a renaissance with another franchise. I think that's what he wants. I'm with you on Baker Mayfield. I've been pretty consistent. I think he played through a pretty serious injury. He took his hits because he played poorly 
I don't think people gave him credit for playing through it. Now, part of it is his own personality kind of rubs people the wrong way. But I think as a, as a player, remember that Cleveland team is not exactly steeped in a winning tradition. He was able to get him back to the playoffs. He was able to win um, a playoff game for the first time in how long, uh, it, you know, I, it, I, I think there's a lot of quarterbacks in this league that aren't as talented as Baker Mayfield. I'm with you. He's not top 10. He's not top 15. Um, but he's better than Sam Darnold. Sometimes I wonder. He's better than Marcus Mariota. Um, sometimes I wonder what these teams think other than, all right, we're in a transition, rebuild, uh, transition if you – if you want to use Jeffrey Lurie's term. So I'll bring it back to the Eagles, Jeff. Um, that's what I love about the Jaquaski tart signing. To me, it indicates, now we already had the indications, A.J. Brown, um, James Bradbury, tra trading target to trade up for Jordan Davis. To me, this puts the period on the Eagles transition. They said, we're done with that. We turn the page. We can compete with anybody in the NFC. Is that how you see the Eagles sentiment, the Eagles mentality right now? Oh, absolutely. And I think a lot of that had to do with how their quarterback played last year. I think last year was the wait and see period. And I know there are a lot of skeptics out there on Jalen Hurts, but they're not making these moves if they don't think this quarterback can up his game to the next level. And I think they, they feel Jalen Hurts can do that. And they did something for him. They have not done for a lot of quarterbacks in this town. Give him weapons early in his career and fire away, see what they can do. And if he can't do it, then I guess you have two first-round picks and you can go find somebody. But I think right now what the Eagles are thinking is we got our guy. We got our quarterback. We're going to give him all the weapons he can. We got the best offensive line in football. We're going to give him a defense so he doesn't have to put up 30 every game to win, like a Patrick Mahomes or an Aaron Rodgers or a Josh Allen. And those teams do have good defenses, but – the Eagles definitely any leak they had in the in their window or in their I, I always forget the saying, but they patched it up pretty quick. So I like the depth of this Eagles team right now. I, I think there are some things they can fix if they want to, but I see the makings of an 11-12 win team this year. JK, uh, you mentioned a couple of names that I want to ask you about. Uh, your home site, CBSSports.com, did a fun story. Uh, it's almost a week ago now, I think. Uh, about the four very good young quarterbacks in the AFC. And I'm referring to Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, uh, Justin Herbert, all of them in relatively close age area. Mahomes a little bit older, Herbert a little bit younger, but they're, they're all very close. Um, all right in their prime and going to be competing against each other in the same conference. The article asked, to rank those quarterbacks, if you had each of them going forward, and you got to bank on a decade for each of them going forward, what order would you put the quarterbacks that I mentioned in, Jeff Carr? Uh, man, it's just tough because I like all four of them. I, I take all four of them to be my quarterback, but I got to go with Mahomes first, just based off the accomplishments. Andy Reid being his head coach, the situation he's in, that guy is not going to have a lot of bad seasons. Uh, but they, if last year was a bad season for Patrick Mahomes, Lord help the NFL because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was pretty good at the end of last year too. Everybody likes Gillen for second half of the AFC Championship game, but he, he ended up having a solid year last year. So I'll go Mahomes first. Josh Allen's right there with him. Uh, Josh Allen in the playoffs last year was – peak Josh Allen, but Josh Allen could do. He adds that running dimension. He's got such a strong arm. Gabe Davis is going to be a great player in this league. Stephon Diggs already is. If Buffalo could get a competent running game and a better offensive line, look out Josh Allen. I, I honestly think Josh Allen could get the Bills to a Super Bowl and win it. I'll go Herbert third just, just on the raw talent. Um, I think we got to see Justin Herbert in the playoffs, but again, not his fault. Head coach had a lot to do with that. Defense had a lot to do with that, but and Justin Herbert was clutch on a lot of situations last year. And now he's got – he got his boy back, Mike Williams, um, which I'm pretty excited about. I know he campaigned for that, and he got it. Uh, he wanted changes on the defensive side of the ball. He got them. Um, so I think the Chargers are going to be a playoff team this year, and I'm excited to see what he can do. 
And I hate to say Burrow fourth because I think he's really good, but and he's got some talent around him too. And now they fixed up that offensive line for him. And Burrow played so well without that offensive line. I think the Bengals went on a crazy run last year to go to Super Bowl and they almost pulled it off. But Joe Burrow going to a Super Bowl that early in his career, just like Patrick Mahomes, that's impressive. If he can put up another year like that again, I, Joe Burrow might be one or two on this list. Yeah. You know what I love about uh, uh, Joe Burrow was the fact that he was able to, and, and the Bengals have tremendous skill position talent, as you mentioned, Jeff, but it's the Bengals. And that's why I hold it against. It's not Joe Burrow necessarily, but I put him fourth on that list as well because I don't trust the Bengals to mm-hmm. do everything uh, uh, to support him, to do everything to win year in and year out. You know Kansas City's going to do that. You know, um, even though it hasn't been successful, maybe you can question the Chargers a little bit. Um, but that's why I put Her- Herbert over Burrow. But it's not really an insult to to Joe Burrow at all. I think it's an insult to the Cincinnati Bengals organization, but that's just me. I, I want to talk to you about the head coach of Josh Allen. We just talked about Josh Allen. Sean McDermott's not going to sleep in his office anymore, Jeff. Is there, a, is there a stupider thing in the NFL than coaches sleeping in their office? Why do you have to wear your work ethic on your sleeve? I've always been told, you know, those who who brag about their work ethic, yeah, they don't have a work ethic. Exactly. It's you know I I used to make the joke too. I remember when I first heard that I used to have a bed in the back of my office. You know, just in case I wanted to nap, I said, "Well, I guess I'm like Sean McDermott. I I, I work so hard, I go to bed in my office." But it's yeah, I, I, John, I'm with you. I, I'm not a fan of the hard work of all the people that say how hard they work and all that. I'm like, show me, you know. You know, yeah. I always say, show me how good you are. Don't tell me, show me. And I'm not saying that Sean doesn't work hard, but this he has does. been a set, really Dick Vermeil going in the Hall of Fame. Uh, God bless you, Dick, but he was the first. And ever since then, it seems like every NFL coach has to act like, oh, I can't go home. I can't have a family life. I can't have. And by the way, that spawns, you know, alcoholism in that industry a lot of issues when it comes to personal relationships because they are never home um some don't want to be home to be honest um the league in general why why do why do you think the owners champion this kind of nonsense and the fact that you know i've heard insults in this steve spurrier on the record you know would like to go golf it oh he's got to be in his office working really does he a lot of criticism with Doug Peterson late in his career here about always oh, out by dinner time. Oh, he's out by dinner time. What is he insane? I, I, why does the NFL have this continue to have this thought process that everywhere else truckers, there's a federal law. You can only work a certain amount of time. Doctors, you know, they can only work a certain level of shifts. Why do football coaches have to work 24 hours a day? It's insanity to me. If they want to work 24 hours a day, that's their right. But you're right. It's, it seems like the owners push it. I actually like the situation John Harbaugh's in. You can tell when he's working, and I don't want to say when he's not working, but you can tell he has a healthy balance of everything he's doing. You know, he embraces – it seems like every aspect of his job, like he's very colorful in press conferences. He doesn't kind of, you know, after a win, he's really in a good mood. When he loses, he's he's in a bad mood, but he's not taking it out on the media. He goes, hey, what do you guys want to know? I, you know I'm here to vent with you. And I, I actually like that about him as someone who's covered a couple of John Harbaugh press conferences. He's, he's a lot of fun. I think he, he balances his work life and his personal life. And, I think a lot of coaches, especially younger coaches, don't do that. And speaking of Vermeil, um, John, I, I think Roger Worski must have told this story to everybody in his life when he saw Dick Vermeil when he was working for ABC and ESPN at Super Bowl 34. And Vermeil went up to him and was talking to him, and he said, they're going to win this game because that's not how he was when Jaworski was his quarterback. And I, I love how Vermeil changed his whole outlook. Like, he actually listened to his players and said, hey, 
you are running us into the ground and, you know, we don't work like you do. And he said, okay, well, we're going to change that. And look what the Rams did. They went 13 and three and won a Super Bowl. So I think coaches change over time once they get the grasp of it. But I think the younger coaches, especially, they drive themselves to the point of they just fry up because they want to win so badly and they have to prove themselves. And once you prove yourself like an Andy Reid, like um, John Harbaugh, Sean McDermott, in my opinion, has proved himself. Maybe he, he doesn't feel that yet because of the pressure that's on his city to win a Super Bowl. I think that's what that's where the burnout comes in. But you're right. It seems like the owners just want these guys to bunker down in whatever practice facility or whatever office they're in. And I don't understand it. I mean, I, I, I say I, this. I, I would go the Costanza route. Just park your car. You're the first person there, the last person to leave. Just leave your car there. Well, and George Costanza, we never knew if he worked or not when he was working for the Yankees. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're trying to balance the scales here. Both you guys saying 24 hours a day, too much for a coach to be about, too much coaching time, too much uh, dedication. Well, then you have the new rules in the NFL where the players – practice for an hour and 10 minutes an hour and 40 minutes nobody does two hours god forbid you go over two hours and or too much physicality in off-season workouts you get fined you get punished the uh, cowboys the commanders the texans all last week got hit with either fines or punishments because they didn't practice properly a little too physical on an off-season practice uh, drills that they're not supposed to be doing in the case of the Houston Texans. Why are we even finding out about this, Jeff? Why are we reading about this? Is it really come to that, that if you ask too much of your players, you're going to get fined as, fined as a head coach? It's coming right out of the coach's pocket, not even the organization. Uh, how how tough is the NFL getting on these coaches? Maybe that's why they're spending twelve hours, uh, 24 hours a day in their office. Got to figure out how to balance the uh, overall worksheet because the players don't seem to be working at all during well, these off seasons. Yeah, that's a great point, Jody. I mean, because I mean, look at Nick Sirianni. It's well, and again, he kind of does it to himself because he he cut down a lot of his OTA practices. By the way, can you imagine if they told Nick Sirianni we're docking OTA from you? He'd probably be smiling somewhere, like, "All right, hey, you can dock yeah. another one." Well, he doesn't out. have any any. What, what, right. What's about with it? the Eagles? Yeah. You just schedule and go. Oh shoot, it's canceled. They weren't yeah. really going to do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's what it is. I think a lot of the older coaches, the old school coaches, like a Mike McCarthy, say, "Hey, look, we got to get these guys on the field. We got to get these guys working out." And they just don't do it. Andy Reid actually is, you know. I, he won't get docked for this because they don't have physical OTAs, but Patrick Mahomes and those guys always talk about the conditioning test. And last week they had the conditioning test and Mahomes said, you see how much I'm sweating right now. So, you know, I think that's, that's where Andy Reid gets his uh, kicks in with that. It's okay. Well, I can't do this, but I can do this. And I think a lot of coaches need to find a way to bounce that, but you're right. That that's how, that's why they're working so much and watching all this film and doing what they're doing. It's it's all, it's like a Herb Brooks and miracle, you know. It's they just keep watching film, just keep watching film, trying to get things right, but they can't actually get their players out on the field to do it. And that's yeah. why I get up, upset when they break down OTAs and what guys are doing and and all that. It's like, look, I, I understand it, but we're not really seeing what we used to see at these OTAs. And you know, John, you've been doing this a long time. You know how different OTAs were back. In Oh, my God. I saw an hour and a half of Eagles work this spring. I would see that in more in a day, uh, you know, back when I started. Um, so it's really difficult. And I think, it, you know, I think it hurts the younger players. I tell Jody all the time, like, how do you open a coach's eyes without being out on the field? And people can talk about the classroom and understanding, and that's fine. But we all know this league is about talent and athleticism and yeah, football IQ is a, a big thing, but there are so many, so many smart football players that you see in college, for instance, and they don't have the, the skill level to play in the NFL. They don't reach the bar to play from an athletic standpoint to play in the NFL. So you got to be able to do it on the field 
And if you're an undrafted kid or even a seventh, a late round pick, sixth, seventh round, how do you prove yourself? How do you prove yourself? So I'm kind of an, in a dichotomy. I laugh at coaches that sleep in their office. I think it's silly. But I'm also, I'm like, from a player's perspective, you gotta you you gotta practice at some point to prove yourself. If you're already entrenched, and it it, it becomes the game, Jeff. So week one, we'll see can these young players play. We'll see uh, week one because we won't you, see it before then. Don't you feel like a lot of these six and round picks? Year one's almost now like a redshirt year because of the expanded practice squads. It's okay. We can get a, a fair look at you with the. With the short time in OTAs, we're not being physical there. Training camp, we're not as physical. We don't have a lot of preseason tape on you. So we're just going to stash you on our 16-man practice squad, and we'll evaluate you from there throughout the course of the season, see if you get better, and we'll give you all next offseason, and then we'll make our determination on you. It, it-